Um, you're all very welcome to our Irish art sale, uh, which is coming up uh, next Wednesday, uh, the 1st of March at 6 p.m. Um, I'm here joined by Aidan Dunn to look at this uh, wonderful collection of works by Edward Maguire from the Patrick McEntee collection. Um, so, Aidan, so you're very welcome. Thank you for being in today. Uh, so, maybe, Aidan, we might start um, and shout it. Maybe for people who aren't that familiar with Edward Maguire, we might just start with a bit of background. Sure. Well, Edward was one of four children of the Senator Edmund Maguire, who was a, a very well-known businessman and a politician, and actually he was a painter as well. That's right. And um, he was quite famous in, in Ireland um, as a sportsman, a businessman, and a general personality, a public and personality. And Brown Thomas, he had the connection in the early 30s. Yeah. He bought Brown Thomas's, so he actually owned Brown Thomas's for a long time. Okay. And during during which time, incidentally, he had Norm McGuinness do the winter displays. Right. Yeah, he remembers. Um, but so Edward was actually, a, Edward Younger was a sickly child, and strangely enough, because he grew up to be, quite against the odds, a very good sportsman. Okay. But throughout his life, there's a pattern that he didn't compete with his famous father, so that while he was very good at sports, he never took it up seriously. And in a way, when he took up art, the same applies because he avoided the kind of um, post-impressionist, very free style that his father was very good at. That's and right. And it was influenced by Yeats, wasn't it? His father was, father was very influenced by Yeats, yeah. And Edward sort of went, made a point of not being influenced by Yeats. Okay. He went the other way. And that way was when he went to Florence with his father on holiday in his late teens, he was knocked out yeah, it was a guy by the ball. quality yeah. of the Renaissance portraits and other paintings that he sold. And he thought there couldn't be anything better than this. Okay. And he decided that he was going to be an artist but he was going to be that kind of artist rather than the 20th century expressionist artist mm -hmm. that his father exemplified. And did he then, and did he go back to Italy then to study? Did he went back to study shortly after. Okay. Yes. And that went very well in some ways in that he was very slow to find his own style. Mm -hmm. So, but he learned the bohemian life of okay. being an artist. That was another thing that emerged. So while he was to the social side, he loved the social yeah. side and had a little uh, sports car that he whizzed around Italy in and generally had a, had a good time uh, eating and drinking okay. and romancing and driving. Um, while all the time was a certain unease because he, he hadn't quite found his voice in his painting. And that emerged slowly and it emerged back in Ireland when he was working here and he was encouraged by Patrick Swift. Yeah, because did he meet, because he, he went to London and he, he studied, London, yeah. studied in the Slade for, mm -hmm. more, I, don't, I don't think that long, and, and by no. Freud was one of his but lecturers. Was one of his lecturers, yeah. Yeah. Point, of course being Freud, uh, later said that he didn't remember. He didn't remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, to be fair, I don't think Freud was a great lecturer at all. Yeah. And tended to be dismissive of, okay. of other artists on the whole. But it was Swift, and I guess, I guess there's that connection, though, because Swift was influenced by Freud. And and then, Freud came over to Dublin and stayed in Swift's studio. That's right. And they knew each other very well. And there is there's reasonable talk that who influenced who in early Swift and early Freud. Yeah, yeah. And certainly early Swift is very impressive and is up to the up to the measure of Freud. Of Freud for sure. And um, it's that that early Freud that he influenced Eddie as well, yeah. I think, you know. Uh, and especially in those early paintings, because you can oh, see yes. that in the yes. in the works very, in the very directly. And he's really, really good yeah. at going in that direction, yeah. you know. And I think that's the beginning of him finding where he was going. Okay. Okay. 
And then from that, so he spent time then, I think it was in the sort of 54, 55, he was in London, he would have been hanging out in Soho. Yes, would have, which was surprisingly lively up the time. Very, we think yeah. of the 50s as being a quiet time, but actually yeah. Soho was where it was at. Where it was at. And there were a large number of Irish people there as well, Okay, including Swift <laughs> and various other people. And it, it was a, an incredibly lively scene. Okay. And then back in Ireland, they came back to Ireland. He would have exhibited then mostly in the the Irish exhibition of Living Artists. I think yes. that was where yes. he would have shown in the 50s. He would have shown. Sort yes. of from mid 50s up to yes. the kind of, I think 1960, around that sort of time. Um, and then I think, I mean, that particular, the Irish exhibition of Living Artists started to wane a little bit anyway at that, around that time. I think it was. Yes, it, a new was it sort of fragmented yeah. and um, went off in different directions. And he found and himself a little outside then. Yes, he did. Yeah, I think in terms of fashion, what he was doing was regarded as being conservative. Okay, yeah. And that actually wasn't fair, as we know we read. Sure. Right? Because realist painting has been reassessed in the light of what we now know. Mm. But at the time, it wasn't very Art was going in, in another direction. Sure. And he was regarded as being old hat. Yeah. And then, so, he sort of found himself showing then obviously the RH. I mean, obviously the other place to show at the time he would have been the RH. He sort of found a home in the RH, yeah. hey, which is... Not very enthusiastically, I think. No, but it, it but made limited in options, and it made sense. limited in options, and it made uh, sense because it's basically his representational. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So he fitted. He to some extent he fitted in. Yeah, but I mean, it might sound like a harsh judgment to say, but he was a better painter and a better artist than most of the people he was showing with. Who was showing with? Yeah, because he had a, a more timeless perspective and mm -hmm. a greater grasp of. The art of what he was doing, representational painting. Sure. And the other then, Aidan, I mean, obviously craftsmanship was was very important to, to Eddie. Yes. Um, and he, and, he, and there's this, I mean, I, which I haven't, I haven't seen, but there's this colour dictionary that he produced over, I, I presume, over many years. Over many years, yeah. Like, he directly worked in a, in a concentrated way for about a half dozen years. But, I mean, I think it was on the cards and played around with the idea for much, much longer. Okay. And the color dictionary was thought of as a kind of conceit or um, entertainment for him. <laughs> but actually, James Smythe, the director of the National Gallery of the Time, pointed out that the color dictionary was absolutely integral to how he worked. Okay. And how he worked was quite unusual in that he mixed Every, every tone and colour you see in his canvas is mixed from colour. He never used black, he never used conventional shades of grey. He mixed complementaries to produce greys and in between tones. And he had a very precise idea of what colour was warm, what combination was cool, and so on. So he was able to pitch the emotional register of a painting by referring in his mind and then when he made it, in, in reality, to this dictionary of combinations that he had. And the, it's, it's a rare thing, mm. and it wasn't really appreciated at the time, because the painters paint by instinct, sure. and you just sort of get on with it and mix colours. But he knew exactly what he was doing at every stage of the game, mm. and it was underappreciated then that he had a great deal to do with the precision and quality of his work and also the liveliness of the surface of his painting. Mm. Even when he's in dark, which should be dead tones, yeah. there's an extraordinary luster in yeah. life to the surface of his painting. And that's quite exceptional for the time and for any time. Yeah, because it's interesting when you look at some of the works here, and obviously we're gonna, we're, we won't look at all the, the works in, uh, in the collection, but they all have this thing where there's almost like a feel of sort of artificial light, like the, the, yes. the, the, the sitters have been lit. Yes. Um, and this beautiful luster. Luster, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I'm just looking here at the, this, the Paul portrait here of Paul Durkin from 81, and actually all the portraits um, here are, are sort of their later works of yes. Paul Eddings from yes. that kind of 81 to... He was extraordinarily... He, he liked poetry. He liked music and poetry, and he was drawn to poets, and there were so many, I suppose one could say there were so many Irish poets around, and it was actually that he would come to paint them. Yeah. And he, 
there's a difference to, uh, there's a split in his work between the work he made out of his own interest and yeah. the work that he was commissioned to do. do. Yeah. Now they're, they're all outstanding. They're all exceptional. Mm. But there's a sort of level of affection in the decisions that he knew, that he knew and wanted to make, to obviously. Sure. Yeah, and actually an interesting because the, the portrait of, of Paddy Collins, I think this is the only portrait that he did of a, of a fellow painter. Painter, and painter. Um, yes. All yeah. the other portraits, as you say, are poets and writers. Poets and writers, yeah. Um, so yeah. again, I, I wondered, yeah. was that a reflection of how Eddie's was, you know, how he sort of sat within the, the kind of visual arts community? Was he a bit of an outsider? He was a bit of an outsider, yes, yeah. and he felt that, I think, yeah. you know, because uh, reading realistic representational work was downvalued at the time mm. in favour of other developments that were going on. And he, he felt that very acutely, I think. He, yeah. he felt um, injured by it. Yeah. And, I mean, he was quite right, because people didn't get what he was doing mm -hmm. to a large extent, and he was regarded as a very gifted but outside the mainstream. Outside the mainstream. Okay, okay, and that's interesting. And, his, and, and the other thing is his output. Um, mm. I know it's been written about many times, you know, that he really produced very few works uh, <laughs> very in a few. couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Like um, he, generally, at the, at the high feel of his working lies, you're talking about no more than six paintings in a year. Right. And probably probably four that he was finished and satisfied with, you know, okay. I mean, that's dramatic. And I wonder, like, is that another reason? Because I think during his lifetime, he only had two solo exhibitions. Solo exhibitions, yes. Yeah. Um, which for, a, for an artist is, is, is quite amazing. And, and probably quite amazing, yeah. the reason being yeah. he didn't produce enough work he didn't, in the year to actually put he the body. He didn't produce enough work to, to assemble a lot together. A lot together. together. But besides that, he put so much into each one. Mm. That he really felt that each one was a kind of event in itself. Self, yeah. Um, so one of his exhibitions consisted of, well, of one painting, basically. Choir. Yeah. And uh, with that next, who he showed obviously the tailors from, he was with he was with Neil Whelan, the Dawson Gallery, and then obviously they, uh, John and Pat took over then took over, in, yes. in the late seventies. Yeah. yeah. And then would have shown with uh, had a show. In, I think the tailors was yeah. in nineteen eighty three. Um, but the previous exhibition with that, would that have been in the Dawson Gallery? It was in the Dawson Gallery, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, great. Well, Sadie, thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, oh, you've great it's about it. into, into Eddie's work. Um, so, uh, we, so if you get a chance, um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to come in um, and see, uh, see a body of, uh, of Eddie's work. Um, it's a rare thing to see eight works of Eddie's together. We will be going on view this Friday, um, all day, 10 to 5. Um, we will have viewings then the weekend on Saturday and Sunday from 2 to 5. And then we'll be back on view Monday, Tuesday, and then on Wednesday till 4 p.m. Thank you so much.